I didn't know what was going on, but uh, I was thinking, oh, it's going to be one of those mornings. <laughs> the, the joys of technology, right? So, hey, uh, we just received our offering here, and so let me remind you, uh, you can uh, use that uh, tithe and offering envelope in the pocket in front of you, cash, check, or your cards, debit or credit cards, we can do those. Or you can also go online. Uh, we did have a, a donate button on our Facebook page, but for some reason, Facebook decided that nonprofits didn't need that anymore, so they took it away from all of us. And uh, so there's a, a post there that has the link to how you can give online if that's more convenient for you. Uh, we have a few people that do that. Some are set up where just automatically every second of the month or 15th of the month, I know their, their offering is going to come. And uh, so if that works better for you, uh, feel free to do that. Or you can stay the old-fashioned way and just throw uh, Benjamins in there. <laughs> or George Washington's, whichever works for you. And um, uh, we appreciate your faithful giving. All right. We want to welcome those that are just uh, joining us on Facebook. And uh, our live stream is now uh, going there. So welcome to those. John chapter 14 is where we're going to be today. Uh, the title of the message is The Way, the Truth, and the Life. It's part three in the series that we've been doing as we lead up to Easter. Just uh, if, you, if you can add up here, you can kind of figure out next week. We'll be looking at the resurrection and the life, and uh, that'll be Easter Sunday, so appropriate for that, that service. I hope that you'll be here. I hope that you will uh, invite friends and family to join you next Sunday. Um, we have... Uh, We've kind of taken it pretty light this year in, in regards to Easter. You know, a lot of times on Easter you're doing all these big fancy things and, and trying to put your, your best foot forward and, you know, maybe have a big egg hunt or some kind of a special music or drama or something like that. And we just decided we were just going to take, take it kind of easy this year and just this is who we are, okay? Um, one thing that I did decide that didn't make it into the uh, bulletin is Next Sunday, for those of the of you that come to the church and not by Facebook, those that you come to the church at 10 o'clock, there'll be uh, pastries and donuts and stuff back there in the fellowship hall. So come and uh, fellowship a little bit before church, have some coffee, uh, get your sugar level up, and uh, then we'll come in here and uh, spend some time worshiping the Lord. Okay? So here we go. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, God is on the move. He is moving and working in the lives of people in this church, but in, also in the lives of people in our families and in our congregation or in our, our community. And I'm excited to watch what he's going to do. Today's Palm Sunday. Today marks the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's a week before he would ultimately uh, face the cross. And as I was reading through my notes again this morning and I read that, this thought came to my mind. You know, about this is the, the, the day he made his triumphal entry. Maybe, maybe today is the day that he makes a triumphal entry into your heart. Maybe the day is the day that he'll make a triumphal entry into your life and radically transform what you've known life to be. Ooh, I like that. Come on, Jesus. At this point in the story, the crowds were cheering for him. Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is not a word that we use in our uh, language vocabulary much anymore. Maybe, maybe during a worship service or something like that. But Hosanna was an expression of joy and praise. It was celebratory. It was a, it was a, uh, a time of rejoicing and celebrating and offering praise in anticipation of a deliverance that was uh, a coming or that had been granted. A lot of times we would have seen this type of an event when, when the uh, military uh, generals would, were coming back from a victorious battle and they would make this procession into the town and, and there would be celebration as they thought about the victory that had been won. Have there been any victories won in the house? Oh my. Lord Jesus, help us. Have there been any victories in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Afraid we're going to have to back up and start all over. Oh, uh -uh. That's not good. The people expected Jesus to overthrow the Romans and to set them free from the bondage that they had been in. 
But that's not exactly the plan that Jesus had for his life. That's not exactly the plan that was about to transpire. His plan, yes, was to set them free, but more than just physical freedom, Jesus was going to offer spiritual freedom. Set them free spiritually. So you don't understand um, that, that you must understand that it's impossible to experience true physical freedom without first experiencing spiritual freedom. Let that sink in for a second. I had to think about that. It's impossible for us to experience complete, true physical freedom without first experiencing spiritual freedom. When we get a taste of physical freedom, we enjoy that, but it will never be full and complete until we have been allowed Christ into our lives to set us free spiritually. Last week was pretty special. I, uh, I had a few comments from people in the church, people outside the church. We had a special visitor last week. If you weren't here, you missed it. Uh, but we had, uh, uh, we talked about the good shepherd, Jesus being our good shepherd. And, and uh, our, our friend Debbie brought us a, a little lamb. And I snuck out and brought that lamb in here. We talked about how the good shepherd comforts and, and uh, cares for and provides for and all that stuff. And uh, so just like the good shepherd uh, that cares for the sheep, Jesus cares for each and every one of us. He wants us to be so familiar with him and with his voice that we are never deceived and we are never led astray. We talked about the only way that that can happen is as we uh, spend time getting to know him. Getting to know him. Here, here's the deal. When I decided that this lady, my wife now, was pretty special, I spent a whole lot of time with her, getting to know her. I wanted to know how she thought, what was important to her, all of those things, the, the dreams of life, what was her background, where did she come, what was she looking forward to, all of that stuff. Those first few weeks that we dated, we were constantly together. If we weren't on duty, we were together. We would go out, we'd go to the park, we'd go to McDonald's, we'd wherever, just to get to know each other better. That's what Jesus wants from us. And the way that we get to know him better is by spending time with him in prayer, spending time with him in his word, spending time uh, in his house, the church, spending time in praise and worship. Listen, if we're going to walk successfully in our Christian faith, we are going to have to get to know Jesus better, and not just better, but better than anyone else. Margo and I have been married 31 years, and uh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Ten of those have been great. Oh, <laughs> She'll get me later. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, what happens when you try to showboat? <laughs> he got me. Sleep in one aisle. Yeah, that was where I was going. I'm our number two. Jesus is number one in her life. Jesus is number one in my life. Number two, this away between us, and then everybody else falls in line after that. And I'm telling you what, if you figure that out and make that part of your being, part of your life, uh, your life will work. It doesn't mean you won't ever have trials or challenges or difficulties. I mean, there will be times when you, you know, want to uh, choke the other one. Somebody, I heard somebody say one time they had a story. They said, "We've, I've never threatened to divorce her, threatened to kill her, but I never threatened to divorce her." Right? You know? So we've not ever been there. We, we've been good. So understand this: no one loves you like Jesus. The week before last, we talked about the true vine. We talked talked about being uh, connected to Jesus, and without being connected to Him we die. Through him comes everything that we have need of in this life. Life and health comes from him. If we stay connected to him, he will care for us and he will help us to bear much fruit. And I like that it's not just much fruit, but it's much good fruit. Uh, good fruit's good, right? However, if we don't stay connected to him, we stop bearing fruit, eventually die, 
And a branch that does not bear fruit is cut off and thrown into the fire, according to the scripture that we read last time. But listen, another another uh, thing that Jesus popped into my mind. Uh, sometimes I have little add-ons in my notes. Uh, this is an add-on. Jesus spoke this to my heart this morning in regards to this. Even when you're connected to the vine, attacks come. Even when you're connected to the vine, attacks come. Here's what I'm talking about. Think about the picture that Jesus was explaining. You know, you have this great vine. It comes up out of the ground and the branches run all along and it produces grapes, right? Even those branches that are attached to the vine experience attacks against it. Sometimes it's pestilence, bugs and insects and all that stuff. Sometimes it's the weather. Right? Uh, what's the movie that we like to watch where they, the frost is coming on the grapes? Uh, oh, Walking the clouds. Walk in the clouds. And, and uh, it's this, this uh, Spanish family, and they have this huge vineyard, and the frost is coming. And so they're out there doing everything they can. They light these furnaces, and they have these big, uh, uh, like, fabric wings. I don't know a better way to describe it. And they're trying to pull the heat down to protect the vine. Listen, even when the branches are connected to the vine. Sometimes attacks come. Doesn't mean you're not connected. Just means that spiritual, I'm going to make it spiritual now, spiritual attacks come. Don't doubt your faith when spiritual attacks come. Instead, hold on to Jesus and, uh, and pray and let him fight for you. You do what you know you're supposed to do. And let him do the rest. Keep in mind that the branches that bear fruit are pruned once in a while. Ooh, that's a good thing. We don't like it, but it's a good thing. As believers, Jesus is going to teach us things along the way. And there will be some things in our lives that need to be cut off. And there will be other things that will be allowed to prosper and to flourish. And those things will bear good fruit. The good news is... If you've been cut off from the vine, there's still hope. God wants you to be grafted back into the vine. That brings us to today, week number three. And we're going to read from John chapter 14. And I'm going to give you uh, verses 1 through 15. And then we're going to focus on verse 6 for our primary portion of the message. Listen as I read New American Standard, John 14, starting in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, hallelujah. Somebody needs to uh, write that down on a piece of paper and stick it in your pocket. Have it there for every day. I almost said you need to get a tattoo. Some people would fall out of church. <laughs> get a tattoo. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Like the King James says, there are many mansions. All right? If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Peter said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus, I can only imagine, talk about patience. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I also do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the truth that is found in these pages. I thank you, God, for the instruction and the encouragement that it brings to our hearts and to our lives. And Lord, today I pray, as we spend time uh, considering this passage of Scripture, Lord, will you uh, anoint our eyes, our ears, our hearts to hear, see, and receive from your word. God, I ask for an anointing as your speaker. Help me, God, to preach your word with authority and with clarity and in truth. Lord, let everything we do today be for your honor and glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we talk about that verse 6, that key verse, the way, the truth, and the life, I want to take a quick uh, jump through a few of these other verses, and then we'll spend some time on verse 6. Look, first one, and I, have, I already gave half of it away as we were uh, just starting to read. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I love this. I love this. He knew that there would be things in life that would cause us to be troubled. He knew there would be things that come against us that would be challenging, that would be difficult, that would cause us to question uh, our actions, our faith, our God, all of these things. And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is saying, believe in God, believe in me. There will be no need for your hearts to be troubled. Amen? Yeah. In a relationship with Jesus, uh, we are assured uh, that God the Father uh, loves us. And when we have that relationship with him, we have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, nothing to be anxious about. Why? Because God is greater than all the stuff that comes against us in this life. He has already defeated our enemy, the devil. We know if you've read the end of the book, if you've read through the book and even the last, you know in the end we all win. Don't let that stuff knock you off course. We can have confidence that he will protect us and he will defend us in our times of trouble, in our times of need. Verse 2, I like the King James. I said that while I was reading. In my father's house are many mansions. Listen, I don't care if I get a cardboard box when I get to heaven. I just want to go to heaven, right? And here's the reason why I say that. I don't say that just to be smart alecky. I say it for this reason. I'm grateful for the all that God blesses me with. I'm a rich man because of him and because of his blessing. But here's the deal. Here's why I say I don't care if I get a mansion or a cardboard box when I get to heaven. Here's the deal. When I get to heaven, I have a purpose. I'm going to join with the angels of heaven around the throne to forever sing his praises, to worship and adore the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of the universe, and worship and praise him for all eternity. Guess what? If I'm at the throne, I don't need a house. Hello? Uh, you know, so I'm not so worried about that. I want to get to heaven and be able to spend eternity with the one who loves me. Listen, if you don't like to worship, if you don't like to praise, you might want to reconsider your interest in heaven. Hello? If you don't like to worship, if you don't like to praise, if oh, the music's too loud or this or that or I don't you know, if you don't like to worship, you might want to reconsider going to heaven. Because that's what we're going to do. That's what it's set up. That's what it's that's our purpose when we get there. Number three, I put on this one. Oh my. The blessed assurance. Jesus says, Listen, if I go to prepare a place for you, it's because I'm coming back for you, and I want you to have a place to stay when I bring you into my house. Hallelujah. It only makes sense. If Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place for us, it only makes sense that uh, he wants us to come and be with him. Heaven is my home, not this world, right? And when I wrote that, I, and I, even now as I'm reading it, oh, you know, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through, right? This is but a flash in time compared to what eternity in heaven will be like. So, uh, I heard somebody say, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Buck up. Man up. 
and you got you got this life, this flash in time, and, and then the rest is eternity in heaven. I'm thankful that he has prepared a place for me. And I'm certain that as, just as he ascended to heaven, one day he will return again. The phrase, uh, receive you to myself, in this passage is a reference to us being raptured. Listen to what Paul uh, told the, the uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, I, I like this. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the end, until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Maybe this is what we're hanging on to. This is the promise of God. This is the, the hope that we have in our walk, in our relationship with God. And even with that promise, I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Verses 12 through 14, Jesus had a task to accomplish. Showing the world his Father, reconciling the world back to him. And that same task has now been passed on to us. Let me speak a word of clarification regarding this uh, portion, verse uh, 12, 13, and 14. The part that says, and greater works than these you will do, some people think that's a reference to the miracles that Jesus performed. Listen, it doesn't get much better than raising the dead. Hello? If you can think of some kind of miracle that's greater than that, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing about it. But it don't get much better than raising the dead. But here's what I believe he's referencing there. I believe, and so do many scholars, that this, in this passage, is the furthering, he's referencing the furthering of the gospel message. You see, he came to that, that one little place in time and in history, and, and the church was birthed out of that. He came and he sacrificed himself. His, his blood was poured out. His body was broken for there. But then he gave the disciples a challenge and a charge to take that, that truth, that message, of, of the salvation that was offered to a lost and dying world throughout all of the ages. He gave it to this little group, and then he said, now greater things, you're going to take it to the world. We've been challenged and charged by the, by the, the word of God to take the message to the world. Another clarification that I want to make in this passage, whatever you will ask, it will be done for you. There are a lot of people that like this one. <laughs> and take this one out of context real easy. Lord, your bio, your word said, if, if I ask in your name, you give me a Cadillac. In Jesus' name, BMW 750LI black, black. Come on, Jesus. No, that is not what he is saying. All right, listen. What it means is that anything we ask according to his will and his plan, it'll be done. I ask God for something that is sinful or contrary to his way and expect him to give it to me, it's not going to work that way. Well, I prayed and God didn't answer. Oh, yes, he did. He said no. That is not part of my plan. That is not good for you. I always say, God must have known that I couldn't handle millions of dollars. And he didn't give them to me, right? He gave me just enough so that I would be reliant on him, trust in him, walk daily, acknowledging him in my life and my need for him in my life, uh, I don't need millions of dollars. Now, I've got a plan. If anybody's got an extra one laying around, an extra million, i got a plan on how we can use that to further the kingdom. So don't be shocked, right? Yeah. But God knew. God knew. So he gives me everything that I have need of. The final one that I want to touch on just briefly, number 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Is a good test. This is a good test of your love and commitment to Jesus. If you're keeping his commandments, if you're doing what he asks you to do, there's a pretty good chance it's because you truly love him. If there's more things that are contrary to his word, then, then uh, there's work to be done. Right? Don't give up. He hasn't given up on you. Don't give up on him. Okay. Now, 
John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The way. Mention, I mentioned this last uh, week and many times before, but there is but one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ, through a personal relationship with him. Amen, preacher. We must accept his perfect sacrifice, the one that was made on our behalf, asking him for forgiveness, asking him to save us, and we must live for him. That's the way. If you want to get to heaven, that's the way it happens. We can try to concoct all of these other ideas and methods, but it simply doesn't work. Scripture supports this truth of Jesus being the way. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Last week we were reminded that he was the vine, the true vine. And if we are grafted in and, and connected to him, we have life. And if we don't, we're cut off and thrown into the fire. The world wants us to believe there are many roads that lead to heaven. Newsflash. It simply isn't true. Matthew 7, I referenced this last week. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Preacher, that's pretty narrow-minded to think that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. The Bible just said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Take it up with him. Jesus is the way. Number two, he is the truth. The reason that he is the way is because he is the truth. We walked through or talked through this last week. Jesus said, there are many that have come before him, and there will be many that will follow after him who claim to be the way. But all of them, all of them have been and will continue to be false prophets. None of them are the only begotten of the Father. None of them have been able to live a sinless, perfect life. None of them freely laid down their lives and then had the authority to pick it back up again. Only Jesus. The world has spent years and years and years and years trying to disprove Jesus. And instead, <laughs> go on. Go on. <laughs> Tell me how my God's not real. Because here's what I've discovered, is that every time science comes up with some way to disprove that God is real, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he lived, that he died according to all that he said. Every time they try to do it, instead of disproving it, they prove him over and over again to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. Think about this for a second. <clears throat> this, this statement hit me. Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. Could it be that every person alive on earth, that if every person alive, alive on earth would accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior, confess their sins, repent and turn away from them, and sin no more, the sin would be eradicated from the earth? If, if everybody accepted Christ and, and our sins were washed away, they were covered by the blood, we, we, we moved in and moved after him, is it possible that sin could ever be eradicated from the earth? Well, we know that it never will be because by nature, we choose to sin. By, by nature, the enemy of our souls keeps moving and working, distorting and twisting and deceiving. It's just a thought. Could it be? What would it be like? No more sin. Oh, I know heaven. <laughs> Jesus is the truth. He is the answer. Finally, he is the life. Number three, because he is the way, because he is the truth, he is the life. Follow the way. Listen, here's the, here's the formula. Some people need formulas. Follow the way, believe the truth, and you can enjoy the life. Jesus said that he came that we might have life 
and have it abundantly. He is the giver of life. He was there at creation when God spoke life into existence. John chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being. Next week, we're going to talk about the resurrection and the life. Only Jesus could conquer death. Only Jesus can give us life. Why? Because he is life. John 1 goes on to say, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is the way. He is the path that leads to God. He is the truth. The reality, listen, the truth, the reality of the promises of God. There's not one thing foretold in this book about the coming of Jesus that has ever been proved wrong. And it never will be. They try. But instead, he is the fulfillment of every promise in this book. And if you haven't, if we haven't seen the fulfillment of it yet, buckle up, Buttercup. It's about to get real. It's coming. He is the life. He joins his divine life with ours for right now and for eternity. He is the way, the path to God, the truth, the reality of God's promises, the life in us and for us for all eternity. And because of that, no one. Number four, and this is the last one, no one comes to the Father but by Him. It's pretty simple. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only one who can give life. If there were someone else that could honestly say and be all that He is, then maybe the statement wouldn't be true. But there's not. No one can, can claim everything that has been fulfilled in Christ. And for that reason, man continues to try to find another way, but there's no way. We think we have it uh, all figured out. We think we have to be right. We think we can fix it on our own. We don't need God. That's what started the problem with sin in the first place, right? Man thinking that they knew better. What it means how we got to the point of, of, our, of this ultimate demise of being in sin. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you the conclusion here in just a moment. As soon as I find my notes, they got out of order. <laughs> just being real. Here's the deal. We could spend a lot more time on each of these statements, but it's simply not necessary. It's simple. Here's the deal. God has made it so absolutely simple, we can't believe it could work. <laughs> right? If it's that easy, how can it work? And so we try to uh, manipulate it into something more than what it has to be. Here's what he says. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, come unto me, all you who are weak, and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He says, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Believe in him. Receive him. And live. Deny him. Reject him. And die. Believe in him and receive him. Be reconciled to God. Reject him and forever be separated. From God. You know, for too long we've heard the stories of what hell will be like and all the torment and the flames and all, and I, and you know, I think all that will be there. But you know what's going to be the, the most torturous part of hell? <clears throat> Being separated forever from God. Being separated forever <clears throat> from Him. 
this is the easiest test you'll ever face in life because there's only two choices. You get a 50-50 shot to get it right. I've said it more, uh, more than once, but I say it again. Because he loves you so very much, he draws you to himself. He calls out to you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to abide with him, but he won't force anything on you. Love doesn't do that. He lets us choose. So what's our choice? Do you believe he is the true vine and the good shepherd? Do you believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life? If so, what are you going to do about it? It's one thing to know. It's another thing to put action to our knowing. If not, if you don't believe he is the true vine, if you don't believe he is the good shepherd, if you don't believe he is the way, the truth, and the life, what more do you need to see to know in order to believe in him? You have a choice. It's up to you. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. Your word that speaks directly into our lives, truth and revelation of who you are what your plan is for us. It speaks of your love for us. It speaks of all that you want to bless us with and, and the future that you have for us. God, it also speaks of what happens if we reject you, if we turn away from you, if we deny the truth. Today, God, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to sweep across this place and God, give revelation to each and every person. Let it begin in their heart and be manifested into their mind, God, where they stand with you. Do we truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Or do we just think we do? Do we truly have a relationship with Jesus? Or have we stubbornly, willingly denied and rejected and Father, I pray that you will you'll turn on the pressure, that you'll turn on, God, that, that wooing and that drawing that you have, have told us. You call us, Lord, call us, draw us. Let us not leave this place today, God, without acknowledging you and accepting you as Lord and Savior. As your bowed eyes are closed across the room, Pastor Carl, I don't know if I know Jesus as my personal Savior. Maybe there's a hint of a relationship. Maybe there's not. Maybe it's just flat out, I don't know Jesus. Today's the day. What choice will you make? Will you accept him today? I don't know him, but I want to. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Let me pray with you this morning. Anyone across the room? Say, Pastor Carl, I think I know him. But after today's message, I'm not sure. I want to make sure if that's you, would you slip up your hand? Let me pray with you. Anyone across the room? Father God, I thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts and in our minds. Thank you for the work you're doing in our church, Lord. Lord, I pray today that you will plant the seed of this message in our hearts. And God, I pray that you will cause it to just uh, to take root and to begin to, to grow in us. Remind us each and every moment of each and every day, God, of the urgency and the importance of knowing you and having a relationship with you, communing with you, God. Father, if there's something that stands between us and you, help us. Help us to see it with our eyes, God. Know in our heart. And then, God, give us the wisdom and the boldness to make a change. Lord, for those in this place who have uh, identified their need for adjustment, change in their lives. Meet them right there in that place. Help them, God, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them, that you have forgiven them. Father, that they have committed themselves fully to you. And then give them strength, power, and the victory. God, from this day forward, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.
We do have youth service tonight at 6.30, Wednesday night at 7. Have a good afternoon.